I'm with Christine Dagg in Jerusalem from Exploits Ministry and the Jerusalem Channel. It's been a big time waiting to get back into Israel. What's it like for you coming back here to Israel? Oh, Paul, it's so amazing to be back here again, and I'm very, very grateful. And I think everyone who lives in the land is very blessed to be here, even though they've had hard times and financial difficulties, perhaps difficulties with sickness. Nevertheless, just to be able to live here, never forget what a privilege it is to live in the Holy Land. Mm -hmm. So it's been a struggle to get back. All the regulations, but hallelujah, Psalm 126 says that when we return to Zion, when we return to Jerusalem, we are like dreamers. And so it's, I'm still in a dream. Mm. Of course, before COVID, you would come to Israel many times a year, wouldn't you? Yes, I really would come about once a month because living in England, it's not too far. And uh, I could go back and forth, do various outreaches, do TV programs. And so not to be here monthly, to be gone for two years, has been quite a struggle. Mm. Now, you have a special Passover Easter convocation here in Israel. Uh, what are you going to be doing? Well, we've been doing these Passover convocations for more than two decades. This is going to be our 23rd one. There are other conferences that we've been doing as well, but this one we've done consistently, and during COVID, we did it by Zoom. But now we're able to come back together again, and we don't have a very large group this time because people are still afraid to travel. They are afraid that once they get here, if they test positive, then they'll have to pay for staying in a hotel. But still, we have a nice group, mm. and the purpose of having a Passover Holy Week convocation is to uh, remember that Jesus is the Lamb of God and that he died during Passover, and that when he died during Passover, he was actually fulfilling Bible prophecy. It wasn't an event that just happened, but it was something that God staged, God orchestrated it. And so to proclaim the Lamb of God during Passover... I think is very important because the Jewish people are celebrating, but they still don't realize that the Messiah has come. But we're here to proclaim that he has come and he's coming again. Who's going to be teaching, will you? Well, I'll be teaching. My husband will be teaching some. We have people from the Arab neighborhoods. When we go to Cana, for example, Pastor Rajai, who leads the wedding chapel there, will be speaking. Gidon Ariel from Root Source will be sharing. Bob O'Dell is going to be sharing about a new commentary he's done on the Torah and the Gospels. And Avi Lipkin of the Bible Block will be speaking. And he's a fascinating person. I know you've interviewed Avi. Mm. And uh, Avi hopes that his party is going to be one of the largest parties because he's bringing together Bible believers and Jews and Messianics into one party. Are people coming from all around the world for this? Sometimes they do. Uh, this time it's mainly going to be Americans and uh, some from Europe. In the past, we've had people from Australia, from Europe, from South America, from North America, and America, of course. So this time it's a little more subdued, but I love it when the nations come up together. Mm. Do you get an opportunity to travel around the Holy Land as well? Yes. We'll be going up to Galilee, and uh, it's a very small conference this year, really. But we will be taking time to go up to Galilee, and I'm excited about that. Mm. And now coming to Israel is always special, but is it more special during Passover and Easter? I think no matter when a tourist comes here, it's always the most important time for that person because the spirit of revelation is here. The presence of God is here so strongly, so it's whenever you decide to come, it's going to be a divine encounter. But there are also God's appointed times, his, his feast days, such as Passover, such as the Feast of Tabernacles, or Pentecost in between. And those have an anointing upon them too. So I really like coming for Passover in Holy Week, especially when they converge as they should do. Now, the churchmen, the Council of Nicaea in 326 AD, decided to go off of the Hebrew calendar of celebrating Resurrection Sunday. And now they, they do it according to the spring equinox. But that divorces the gospel from its historical context. It makes it very difficult to understand why Jesus died and when he died. 
So one of the purposes of our conference is to point to the fact that Jesus died during Passover, whenever it is celebrated. And of course, it's in the Hebrew month of Nisan that it's celebrated. Mm. Because if it's celebrated at a different time, pagan elements come in, like Easter bunnies and Easter eggs. And all of that has to do with a fertility goddess. And it's devoid of the truth of the gospel. Mm. So we're trying to take the broom of the Holy Spirit and sweep out some of this paganism and celebrate the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus at the time that it actually happened during Passover as a type of the atonement to, to prove that the atonement for our sins has been achieved by the Lord mm. as the Lamb of God. Uh, will you be doing a Seder Passover meal? And is it important for Christians to be involved in a Passover meal? We usually do some type of Seder. Sometimes we have staged it in different locations. We've even had a Passover Seder in Egypt, for example, because we, we know that the Passover story is about the Jews coming out of slavery in Egypt into the Promised Land. We've had Seders in the Hashemite Kingdom of Jordan. All over the land of Israel, we've had them. This year, it's going to be sort of a small event in the old city of Jerusalem, and I think it'll be a very precious time of prayer, a time of intercession on the night that all of the Israelis are uh, coming together at their table with the chair for Elijah, waiting for the Messiah. We will have revelation knowledge that Messiah has come and celebrating the fact that he's coming again. And when he comes to collect us and take us, we'll be going to an upgraded Seder which the book of Revelation calls the marriage supper of the Lamb. So the next day, after our Seder in the old city, we're going to go to Cana, to a wedding chapel in Cana, and there just have a prophetic meeting, have a prophetic prayer meeting about the fact that Jesus is returning and he's taking his bride, the body of Messiah, to his father's house. And there we will have the marriage supper of the Lamb. So these little events are prophetic and they're very prayerful. Of, of course, there's a lot of things that Christians can learn from the Passover meal as well, isn't there? Yes. Well, you see, Jesus and his friends when, and his disciples, when they had this meal in the upper room, which we know as the Last Supper, they were commemorating the fact that the Israelites were delivered out of the slavery of sin. But now, during his Last Supper... During his last Seder, he is going to upgrade the Seder and in some ways rewrite the liturgy, which is really quite revolutionary. And he took the bread of affliction, the unleavened bread, the matzah bread, and, and he said, this is my body broken for you. And then he took the cup of redemption from the Seder and said, and this is my blood shed for many. And so he instituted the Last Supper, he instituted Holy Communion. And from that, we learned that we are delivered and we celebrate that we're delivered, not from the slavery of Egypt, but from the slavery of sin. And so when we sit around this table, we are remembering all of these things and we're entering into a time warp, so to speak, knowing that this took place, but that the marriage supper of the Lamb will be happening in the future. And here we are, believing that Bible prophecy is being fulfilled and praying that God's program will come to pass right on time because God can fulfill prophecy without Paul and without Christine. But mysteriously, he says that we as intercessors have to pray. That's why we're stationed as watchmen on these walls. He expects us to pray and participate with him and be partners with him in intercession to bring his end time program to pass. Uh, now you also have a women's conference every year, Women on the Wall. Tell us a bit about that. This is something, one time I was uh, in Wales in a worship service and I saw a banner come down from heaven and it had the name of Women on the Wall praying. And the Lord said to start these New Year intercessory prayer meetings in January to pray for the year. And so we've done this for a number of years, and we've had prayer walks on the ramparts of the sacred walls of the old city, and we have different speakers, and it's just a great time 
to come together and lay our calendars before the Lord and say, a new year has begun and uh, we want you to be with us, Lord, and we want to be your intercessors on these walls. So we haven't been able to do it because of COVID, but we're hoping since the minister of tourism of Israel says he's not going to close the skies and we want to hold him to that, we want to have another watchmen and women on the walls convocation coming up in January. And usually we couple that with some sort of a ministry trip and we're hoping to get into Saudi Arabia because many people may have seen on the internet that the real Mount Sinai is not at St. Catherine's in, in the Egyptian Sinai, but it's actually located in the land of Midian in Saudi Arabia. And there's a lot of evidence for this. Jebel El Laws, which is Mount Horeb or, or Mount Sinai, has a burn top to it. And down below the mountain, there is an altar and there are the 12 pillars still there of the 12 tribes. Jethro's home, you know, the father-in-law of Moses is not far away. Everything, Elam, the oasis of Elam, all of these details of the Exodus route are there in Saudi Arabia and just tick the boxes. Mm. So we hope to go there because Saudi Arabia is now opening up to tourism, and we want to combine those two trips. Should Christians today have a heart for Israel and why? Yes, I believe they do. And uh, recently I wrote an article for the Christian world of the Jerusalem Post on why Christians should support Israel. Because a lot of people think, well, it's just a secular nation. They have many sins in the nation of Israel. So why should Christians support Israel? But part of the reason why we support Israel is that as Christians, we have to, we're, we're commanded to honor our parents. And the Jewish people are our patriarchs. They are our spiritual parents. Because after all, Jesus said in the Gospel of John that salvation proceeds from the Jewish people. In other words, they are our root. The church could not stand without the roots of our Israelite patriarchs. And so we have to appreciate them. The book of Romans tells us that uh, not to be ignorant, that we owe a debt to them. We owe the debt for the Savior who was from the tribe of Judah. We owe a debt to them because they kept all of the scriptures. They kept everything that we have inherited. And God has judicially blinded them for a season so that the gospel can be preached around the world and the church can have members members of the body of Messiah from every nation. But the New Testament teaches that when the fullness of the Gentiles has come into the church and when the full number is completed in the church and only God knows when the last Gentile is saved, Mm. then the church will be completed. And a lot of people think, especially in the church, what? Well, the church is going to go on indefinitely, generation after generation. No, There is a set time for the church to be completed. It's called the fullness of the Gentiles. And then, Paul taught, all of Israel shall be saved. That's why the Jewish people have been brought back to the Holy Land, because they have to be back in the land in order for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and and for their national salvation. So I believe, Paul, that very soon, the fullness of the Gentiles will be completed within the church. I believe in the pre-tribulational rapture. I know this is a controversial subject for a lot of people, but I believe that's what the tenor of Scripture teaches, if we rightly divide the word of truth. Mm. And then what happens after the removal of the church, because the church is only a parenthetical body between what the prophet Daniel teaches about Israel's 70 years In other words, 70 weeks of years, according to the prophet Daniel, were determined upon Israel to complete salvation. But seven of those years are left. It's as if the nation of Israel has been put on hold. It's like Israel is a stopwatch in God's hand. But when the church is completed, God is going to take his finger off the stopwatch, and then there will be seven more years, biblical years, of Israel's history in which 
they'll go through great tribulation, but they'll be saved. So I believe we're living in the last days, Bible prophecies being fulfilled. And it's very important to understand that God has brought the Jewish people back for a purpose to bless the world, not to be a problem to the Palestinians, but to be a blessing in the midst of this land. And he's still bringing them back today from Russia and Ukraine as well, isn't he? It's so amazing to, to see how whenever a nation is shaken, as Ukraine is being shaken, the Jews get shaken out. Mm -hmm. And God favors their return at this time to the land because he has to have them back as a nation in order for the Holy Spirit to be poured out on them uh, and for their national salvation. And so they're here to bless the world, and we really pray that our Arab brethren can make room for them. I know it's difficult. Sometimes Arabs feel disinherited, dispossessed by having the Jews back in the land. But their purpose for being here is to receive Messiah when he returns. And so we want Jesus to come back. But he said, I'm not going to return until the Jews say, Baruch Haba, Beishem Adonai. They have to be here in order to welcome the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because he said, the world is not going to see him again until the Jewish people welcome him, until they say, Baruch Haba, Beishem Adonai. So that's why they must be back in their own land. It's all part of God's end time program that the Jewish people will be in situ, in place, to receive Messiah. And the way the birth pains of Messiah are happening, Jesus said on the Mount of Olives, when the, when the disciples asked him, what will be the signs of your return? And he gave all the birth pains of the wars, the rumors of wars, the famines, the earthquakes. But he said Jerusalem also will be trodden down by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are completed. So in 1967, Jerusalem came back into the hands of the Jews and was taken out of the hands of the Gentiles. So that tells us that Jesus is coming soon because people say, oh, Christine, we've always had wars. We've always had famines. We've always had pestilences. So that doesn't mean Jesus is coming. But I say, yes, we've had those signs. We've had those birth pains. But no generation has had the sign that we have, and that is the Jewish people back in the land. Mm. And that tells us, Jesus said, when you see that, know that his coming is very near. And so we have to live day to day, Paul, knowing that he's coming and not fall into sin, not be angry with people, because this whole world is not going to continue as Star Trek teaches, but the church age is going to be completed. And Israel will be saved. And then the millennial kingdom, Jesus' thousand-year rule, will begin. Do you remember after his resurrection? And it's good to talk about this because we're in the resurrection season. The disciples came to him and, and said, Lord, you're alive. You're here. Are, are you going to establish the kingdom on earth now? It made sense to them. He had gone through all that suffering. Now he's resurrected. Are you going to establish the kingdom now? He said, no, you have to first go around the world and win all of the nations, and then the end will come. So this is, has happened. The gospel has been preached all around the world, mm -hmm. and now is the time when he is going to establish the kingdom on earth. He's going to return and do it. How many times have you been to Israel? I think over 300 mm -hmm. Probably, many more than that. Uh, now, you've worked with Reinhard Bonnke, and you travel the world with a message. What is your message? My message is that Jesus is coming soon, and I believe this is the generation, and to be ready for his coming. And whatever you're going to do, do it with all of your might and find out what the Lord wants you to do, because Bible prophecy has a sell-by date. And these Bible prophecies about the second coming of Jesus all pinpoint our generation. Why do you do what you do? I had a great desire put in my spirit. God often works through desire. People who, who preach, for example, 
they have such a desire to preach that nothing else satisfies. Or maybe God is calling them to a country, so they have a great desire to live in that particular place. So I always had that desire to serve the Lord. But then I had a supernatural dream in which I saw myself standing on Mount Zion here in Jerusalem. And I heard the voice of the Lord speaking from his glory that he was calling me to stand in Jerusalem in the last days. And so I, I want to remind the Lord right now, Lord, you call me to stand in Jerusalem. So don't let me be locked out of here again. Keep these skies open. <laughs> and what's your prayer for Arab and Jew? That they can be one in Messiah mm. because God loves the Arabs so much. You know, Paul, I thought that God had called me to the Jewish people. And so he did through the dream, uh, through various revelations. And my husband and I came here to start a media ministry. But I got a revelation because after one of our news broadcasts one night, I went out and preached the gospel to the Arabs. And they were totally open. And Reinhard Bonka used to say, never waste a harvest. It's not time for uh, the Jews' harvest, but it is time for the Arabs to be saved. He's pouring out his spirit in the Arab world. As you know, Muslims are having dreams and visions. And so this is the time that God is particularly blessing Arab people with dreams and visions. And I just love them. God gave me a supernatural. I love the Arabs as much as I love the Jews. And a lot of people haven't understood that because when you come here, either you're in one camp or the other, but God enlarged my heart to see that they're brothers and that there is something the Bible calls an Isaiah chapter 19 highway in which Egypt, Israel, and Assyria, which is coming back into being, will all be together in a messianic league and uh, they will all be favored nations. So I say Arabia is going to be saved. Now you have uh, the Jerusalem Channel. What's your website for people who'd like to know more about the teaching? Well, I'd love for people to visit the website, and it's jerusalemchannel.tv. Okay, Christine, thank you much. It's wonderful to be with you again, Paul. Thank you. Yeah.